Church, and we're thrilled to have you here to reflect on uh, media and how we get our news. And uh, we just want to say we're thankful that you've shown up tonight and are engaging in this important topic uh, with the weather. I imagine you'll have people drifting in uh, for the next 20 minutes. If you're back far and you want to come forward, uh, that's, of course, always an option. So I will uh, hand over the mic to our moderator and we'll get you all started. So I'm Jan Larson, I chair of the Department of Communication and Journalism here in town at UW-Eau Claire. I also have a background um, in print journalism before I became an educator. I did want to let you know, because Dave Gordon uh, told me not to stand on ceremony, there's cider and cookies in the back, so if you get hungry, go help yourself, that's fine. We won't mind you getting up and down. I would like to know if I can point out to people where the restrooms are. I, I guess restrooms down the hall. Women's is out there, men's is here. Oh, no. Um, but that those are available to you as well. We're going to spend about 45 minutes to an hour with the panelists. There'll be time for questions. If it seems like we're ready to move into questions, if everybody kind of exhausts what they want to say, we'll do that sooner. But we have the room until about 8, 8.30, so that'll be fine. Um, today we're going to be talking about social media, and this is part of News Engagement Day, which is a national day that the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communication sponsors each year. So around the country, in communities all over the, the nation, you've got news organizations coming together to somehow promote engaging in the news. And here in town, Dave Gordon was one of the people behind making sure that we had an opportunity to talk about some aspect of news. Again, we're going to be looking tonight at social media and the news. And um, we realize that more and more people are getting their news from social media. I put together a little binder here of all kinds of little articles about that that I might refer to as I ask questions if the panelists need a little guidance um, in their remarks, but we do know that, that uh, we've got more than two and a half million internet users, and about 64% of them um, get some of their news from social media. That makes it necessary for news organizations to consider how they're going to use social media and um, what it's going to mean to the way they interact with the public. Along with that, we also realize that there are parts of our nation where people don't have access or resources to pay for internet and, and maybe even can't access it. Not everybody can afford a cell phone. So that raises issues too for news deserts and people being without information. So I'd like to start by introducing our panelists to you and then giving them an opportunity to maybe first talk about how their organizations use social media to reach an audience. We have Gary Johnson, who is the executive editor of the Leader Telegram. We have Liz Domes, who's a digital content producer for Wisconsin Public Radio. We've got Tom Giffey, who's managing editor of Volume One, a local arts and entertainment publication. And we have Dan Schilling, more recently the news director at WQOW, but now in retirement is their community outreach coordinator. So, I'm going to go down the line and give each of you um, a few minutes to answer that first question of how does your news organization, um, in your case your entertainment magazine, interact with social media and your audiences. Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> Leader Telegram has had a website for who, 15 years probably. Uh, our print product comes out every day. We post stories to the website. Uh, as if something happens in the afternoon, uh, breaking news story, uh, the tornado activities in Barron, uh, what, I'm sorry, in Wheaton over the last week, is a good example of how we've used uh, our website. We update it, we put something up as, as soon as we had information about it, and then we built on that throughout the day. So anybody who subscribes to the newspaper, the digital newspaper, uh, in most instances, would be able to access that because this was a very important issue, uh, very the, the news of the day. We actually opened up that story to everybody. Ordinarily, you would need to be a subscriber of the print version 
or the online, the digital version. But otherwise, you know, <clears throat> we do have we do have a, a paid website which, you know, for, for many years uh, we simply gave all our news away, uh, which was a horrible business model. <laughs> Uh, and we, it was really hard to reel back in. Uh, within the last six months, I think it was April 1st, we went to a paywall. Uh, and that's when we, I think it's been good, we have like a thousand digital readers, right? Simply digital readers. Uh, we obviously have many more. Uh, we have like 18 to 20,000 print readers. Uh, but we try to supplement, you know, the newspaper. We want to promote our newspaper uh, through social media, through Twitter. Uh, through Facebook to drive traffic to our website. Uh, it's a good way to promote. We put a, the front page of the newspaper every day. Uh, we take a snapshot of it and, and put it on Facebook, and we can and then we link to our that day's website. Uh, Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see you all out. So as Jan mentioned, I'm the digital content producer for Wisconsin Public Radio. And we at the radio station have worked really hard over the past couple years to really increase our digital presence. Um, it's become a major platform for us as far as investment goes. And that's sort of part of my position as well. As, so a digital content producer, for those of you who might not be aware, is essentially comparable to being a digital journalist. So I'm taking articles, I'm writing articles for our website that then get distributed out via social media. Or, at, or on our website, obviously. So basically, um, it's, social media becomes a really important element for us because um, it's one way that we can reach a lot of our audience, but um, it, it also is really measured and we're really deliberate about who can post and when they can post. So we are really specific about scheduling when articles show up online on social media and um, Sometimes we have people um, from different from uh, the Ideas Network from different shows post like a uh, promo about a segment coming up and say, you know, hey, we're going to be talking about this. What do you think? So it's one way that we can engage with our audience, but in other capacities, we'll um, showcase the uh, articles that the reporters or myself and my uh, colleague Mary Kate McCoy are writing. So it's really important, it's a really important element, a way for us to connect with our audience, but um, that's just one way that we do it. There's so many other ways to, you know, whether it's just our website, WPR.org, and obviously the radio that we're reaching, we're trying to reach as many people as we possibly can. Um, yeah. So I think that's all I've got for now. No, but which specific platforms are you, are you using? Twitter, are you using Facebook, are you using Instagram? Which is yeah, that's a great question. Well, actually, so this is this is really interesting because initially when we had started, all of our shows had their own Facebook page. So Larry Miller had his own his own page. The Morning Show had their own page. Central Time had their own page, and it was through a lot of deliberation and some arguments that we decided that that probably isn't the best the best way to go about it. So what we have now is we have a Facebook page for the Ideas Network. Um, and then we also have, a tw uh, mostly for Twitter, we also have a Twitter account for the Ideas Network as well. But on Twitter, it's a lot of the reporters who are sharing their own stories, a lot of reporters who are sharing other people's stories, um, but, but there still is that interaction with the Ideas Network uh, Twitter page and Facebook page. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, our, um, our news organization really has a two-way relationship with social media, as I imagine most do. Um, we certainly post things, um, you know, stories go on our website. We're, we, the, the print magazine, as many of you might know, only comes out every two weeks. Um, but obviously, we, we have the capability of putting things on live on the web any old time. Um, we it is much easier to measure who you're reaching with social media, as many of you might know, um, than through traditional means. You know, in the broadcast business, there are ratings books. Um, even in the in the newspaper business, you, you know roughly who your subscribers are, 
Um, you know, there are audits to make sure the circulation is what you say it is, so you have some sense of who's reading you. With a free distribution publication, we put it out there on the rack. Two weeks later, we put a new one out, and we know, okay, we're bringing X number back, so this number is being read, but we don't really know much other than, you know, doing some sort of readership survey who's reading us. When you look at the actual numbers on Facebook, which is our main social media connection with people, you can tell exactly how many people have read um, or at least seen what you've put <laughs> or have watched your video, which means having watched the first three or ten seconds of your video. Um, you know how many likes you have, you know how many shares you have, you know what's getting some traction in terms of what people are commenting on. Um, it takes some of the guesswork out of um, and, and demystifies some of what you might otherwise do when you, oh, this sounds like a good story, we'll write an article on it and we'll put it in the magazine and, and the people will see it over the course of two weeks and maybe they'll get some feedback on it. Um, social media really gives you the capability of getting immediate feedback. Um, and I mean, the two-way relationship comes in the form of getting ideas too, and I'm, I'm sure we're certainly not alone in this, um, that there are times where we toss an idea out there, hey, what do you think about this? Um, I may do that on my own personal social media, ask friends like, what is a restaurant you love to take your kids to? And you might, you know, crowdsource some ideas and maybe you'll ask people, hey, you know, can I use your quote in the magazine? Or simply it's just a way of getting ideas. So there's, there's lots of ways that you can immediately get feedback rather than, you know, uh, in, a, in a pre social media or pre digital age where you might have had to, oh, we'll run a little item. Um, in the print edition, and hopefully people will call us or write to us about the question. So there's, um, you, you have a much more fluid um, two-way relationship with people, which of course can cut both ways, and I'm sure we'll get into that. So, uh, the television business model, of course, is based on broadcast, and that's still where we derive the lion's share of our revenue, and it's, as Gary indicated, it was a bad business decision in the early days of the internet for us all to decide to put these stories on the web for free, because once that ketchup is out of the bottle, it's hard to put it back in again. Um, so what we've done is uh, to supplement the television viewing at morning, um, we have an 11 a.m. broadcast, and then 5, 6, and 10. Uh, as reporters gather facts and confirm them and make sure that everything is correct, we go ahead and publish those on our website and almost immediately include a link to Facebook and Twitter. Um, we're just starting to dip our toes in Instagram a little bit. I, I'm, that was about the time I was leaving, so I'm not quite sure what they're doing there. But So the idea is, um, obviously none of us make any money off of social media. Uh, you can't place advertising, well, you can, but we don't. Uh, so the only source of revenue, the only way to monetize whatever we do on social media is to hopefully get people to click the link that takes them back to our website where we can actually count and, and where we actually sell advertising on our website. So that's been, that's been the struggle as the social media phenomenon has taken off is how do you monetize it? And I, you know, journalism is great, but somebody has to pay the bills. We have a staff over there of 20 people, journalists and technicians, and uh, we would love to be able to pay them more, but it gets very, very difficult in this environment that we're in right now. We'll, we'll be talking more about um, money, I'm sure, as we continue our discussion, but there's something that you said about moving traffic that relates to a recent Pew survey that found that 57, there's a 57% increase in traffic to news sites referred from social media, which implies that there's value in posting to social media because it, it pushes it pushes people to the to the pay sites or or makes them more interested in consuming um, what's going to be on the TV news later, and the, and then your ad ad numbers will go up. The challenge is that according to researcher who wrote an article in, that appeared in the journal of science. Did the mic disappear? No, it's still there. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a researcher from MIT had an article published in the journal called Science that fake news is actually more likely to spread than truth. 
it goes viral. So how do you folks compete against social media that is wrong, that is a hoax, that is not real? What it, how do you delineate between what you're doing and what people are likely to bump up against on the internet or through these other social media platforms? Well, I think we just have to keep telling people what legitimate newspapers, media outlets are. You know, when people go to the, go to Facebook and they they, re, they I read a story on Facebook. Well, who wrote that? Who wrote for that? I I didn't look. Well, that's the first thing you have to do is look and see. You know, is that did that come from the Washington Post uh, or did it come from some place you've never heard of? If you haven't heard of it, I don't want to look at it because then you start repeating that. You know, so I think. What we need to do is just keep branding our newspapers and, you know, whether it be the Washington Post, the New York Times, or the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, the Leader Telegram, uh, or any smaller weekly newspapers. You know, we have to show people that we are the ones who pay people to collect information, to dissect it, to ferret out what is the truth and what isn't, you know, to make it a fair and balanced story. You know, instead of somebody who you know is sitting in in mom's basement and decides to throw something up on the website and says something that's a, a hoax or fake news. I mean, there is fake news. Fake news is stuff that's not correct. But it's not news then. It's not news. Correct. <laughs> oh yes, I. This is such an interesting conversation to have, and and Gary mentioned the word dissection, and I think that's so important. Education is to people need to understand that it's their responsibility to look at multiple news sources, if um, you know, to try and to try and uh, identify what the truth is. Um, there, you know, we can we can easily identify. Yes, the Washington Post, Leader Telegram, these are trustworthy news sources. Um, you know, but if you're coming against something on social media and you're reading it and there's, um, there's opinions in there and not fact and there's no attribution for it, you can, you can question that. You can, you can read that with, um, you know, not through rose-colored glasses, but, but with some questioning and say, um, okay, like how do I know that this is true? How do I know that this is real? So it's, there is some education in that and maybe it falls on us journalists to explain to you, you know, this is something that you need to do. You need to take responsibility too to, to make sure that you're getting, um, you know, a, a wide variety of, of news in your, in your diet. But um, yeah, I just, I would just urge you to be as, um, as deliberate as you can about making sure that you really question um, whether what you're getting is opinion versus fact. Um, that's probably the most important thing I can tell you tonight. I think those of us who work in local media are, we're lucky in this respect in that there aren't really people making up fake news or hoaxes on the local level. Um, you know, are they, are they putting, making things up out of whole cloth? Have you read it? Not recently. I mean, I know it is a very it is an opinionated uh, piece of uh, the publication. <laughs> um, and I don't even know if they have a social media presence, honestly. But I, what I was going to say is that you know, if you are in the business of national news and you have national figures who are calling the objective truth, quote unquote, fake news, or you have um, you know, clickbait headlines that are run by shady characters that are essentially meant to monetize people's anger, right or left. Um, you know, you, you certainly run into problems there in trying to get the actual truth out there. But if you're looking at local news, if we publish something about, take a look at the new downtown development, there's not really anybody um, out there trying to do a bait and switch with local news. Certainly people will jump into your feed and um, tack on their own uh, comments and their own <laughs> conspiracy theories and their own, um, go off about their own agendas. And oftentimes uh, 
those have nothing to do with what the actual story is about. We've all seen this reading the comment threads. Um, and you, you often wonder, did any of these people actually read the story? <laughs> you know, uh, surprise, no, they didn't. Um, or they would have gotten the top context. I've seen some, some pretty humorous things on, on Twitter and Facebook with national journalists where someone will take the writer to task. Well, obviously, they didn't read the article. Well, no, I'm the one that wrote the article. Um, but I think all of this points to a, a very urgent need for media literacy education. Um, I don't have any great ideas on how to do that, but we all, at least those of us in the adult world, have already sealed ourselves into kind of self-reinforcing bubbles where what comes up on social media is often from our peers and our families who often have the same um, biases and lifestyles we do, so they're um, most likely going to be liking and sharing stories that reinforce that worldview. So if I have any advice for anyone, um, it is to, if you see something that sounds too good to be true, it probably is, or something that um, sound, it, it reinforces your own view of the world, you should naturally be skeptical of it, which is sort of counterintuitive. We all seek out information um, that makes us feel good and that, that makes our worldview seem right, but we all have to be skeptical. You know, my own wife has been married to a journalist for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I will, when she's going through her Facebook page, she'll see some headline that may be completely accurate, but she'll say, oh, this is coming from such and such source. Is that a legitimate source? And she'll actually go to the trouble of Googling and finding out who the heck this is coming from. And there are plenty of, you know, BuzzFeed News is a legitimate journalistic source, um, but it has a very strange name. And if you're not in that realm of, being extremely online, it might sound kind of strange when you see something reported about the Trump administration from BuzzFeed News, but it's a legitimate news source. Um, something else with a goofy name might not be. I don't have any statistics to back this up, but I have a feeling that a lot of the people who are reading and responding to uh, fake news are people who are, are not ordinarily news consumers. And um, I can tell that by some of the comments that we get posted on our Facebook page, too. Uh, you can tell that they're not people who have spent a lifetime reading the newspaper or watching television news or listening to radio news because they get outraged about things that those of us who have spent a lifetime consuming news take for granted. Uh, I'll give you an example. Every time we post a picture of a traffic accident where somebody's been killed, some people go, oh my god, why are they posting that picture? Well, news organizations have been posting those pictures for as long as there's been photography. But these people who are reacting to this don't consume news. So the only time they see it, or their only exposure to news is when they're scrolling through their Facebook feed or their Twitter feed. And then they get all outraged about it. So, um, you know, I like to think, and maybe I'm kidding myself, but I like to think that uh, the people who are legitimate news consumers, who are people who have grown up with newspapers and television and radio, um, are able to determine what's a legitimate social media post and what's not. Um, that certainly doesn't mean we don't need some more education, and I would hope that that would start in the schools, but I think, I think smart news consumers know what's real and what's not. I will share with everybody but that if you go to the University of Michigan and you, add, and you search for their game on critical thinking and the news, you can call up a progressively more difficult quiz where they show you parts of a news story and they ask you to decide whether it's real or fake. And it tests your critical thinking to understand what are the things that you should be looking for. Um, is there attribution? Is it a legitimate news organization, one that's recognizable? There are a couple other things that they, they help train you to think about. And they have, it, they have it at a level for children as well as for people in, say, high school and college, you know, adults. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting thing. I often bring it into my classes. So if you're looking for something like that, maybe, maybe you've got some young people in your life or, or you just want to test your own ability to judge critically, um, Google the University of Michigan. Um, news judgment test, and you'll find you'll find that. 
Um, one of the things that I wanted to comment about was, was the, this idea, you know, I had asked the question is, how do you distinguish yourself as journalist? And you talked about branding yourself as the people who um, um, are skilled at doing this. I think one of the things that came through, though you didn't use that exact term, was that you're transparent in what you're doing. You identify your sources. Um, you explain where everything came from. You use credible sources. I think that's something that's going to be really important moving forward is that people will see the difference in social media sites because with this phone, anybody can take photos, shoot video, edit it, and put it on their Instagram account and have a little news story, which is a great tool for a reporter, but it also means that anyone can be a journalist, which is a good thing because we want a free press, but at the same time, if they don't follow the principles that these people talk about, and that's, that's going to be the problem. Um, which leads me to my next question. How do you see the definition of, of journalist changing with the introduction of all of the social media platforms and opportunities for using it as a profession, being a social media X? How do you see the definition of journalist changing? Uh, the definition, you're right, I mean anybody with a phone can go out and take pictures and can come to this meeting or go to a school board meeting and write half a dozen paragraphs and put them on a website and say, and you don't know anything about the background of this person if they have an agenda. I mean that's the main thing, you know, these news organizations, you know, we go to be objective when we cover an event. We don't go there, you know, because I, you know, I know they're going to talk about my kids' boundaries. But I'm going to write this story from the school board meeting, you know, just so people see how bad it is that they're what they're doing to all these these people, that, like my neighbors and me. You, know, you wouldn't know that if this just pops up. That's why you know the, the credibility of the source. That's why a journalist still needs to have that training so we can learn how to digest information, how to you know, write things, how to figure out what's the most important. When you, you go to a two-hour meeting, you have to figure out what was the most important thing that happened there and bring that across to people. Not something, I mean, you do need the training for that. You need to, as I said, not have the agenda because you wouldn't know. Maybe there's that, that boundary issue in the middle of that meeting might be the thing you know going in. You're going to write about that because that's what I'm interested in and the people I hang out with are interested in. As opposed to reporter from one of these news organizations who is going to go write about what happened. I mean, you, you're probably going to know what's going to be real interesting there, but it's not because you have a vested interest in it. So I think that one of the main ways that social media um, has really impacted our news organizations is um, it's really changed the way we see deadlines. Um, <laughs> And because we can, we can go cover a tornado, um, you know, the, the havoc rig from a tornado, and we can, for example, when I worked for the Leader Telegram, I went up to a woman in her car, I had my, my phone out, and I recorded her, and I said, what happened to you? Tell me about your experience. And I was able to, like, quick edit that, put that up on social media, and then continue on with my reporting for the next day's newspaper. But I think that 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 makes um, the elements of journalism particularly important because there's still a need for us to get the facts right. We're still, our readers, our listeners, our viewers are still depending on us to provide all the accurate information and answer all the questions that they have. So while rushing, you know, to get all this information out as quick as we can, we still have to be so careful about making sure it's the most accurate information, making sure that we're attributing the facts that we hear to the to the right sources, um, you know, making sure that that we're still meeting the need of people who are, you know, reading or watching um, what we're putting out there. So I think um, that's probably one of the biggest changes I've seen. Um, you asked how the definition of journalism journalist is changing. I hope it doesn't change. Tools may change. I mean, the way things were done when I started 
working for Gary 20 years ago, for God's sake, 20 years. Uh, you know, mechanisms have changed. I know. Um, it disturbs me when I see people interviewed or, or posting on social media and shared on social media who are like um, independent journalists. And certainly you can be an independent journalist, you can be a freelancer, you can have your own website and, or blog, and you can be doing real journalism, and people do. But often it, all this means is they're an independent pontificator um, who goes in with their own agenda and reports, meaning they go and stick a microphone in somebody's face and tries to get them to say something outrageous that makes um, either their side look intelligent or their side look stupid and then you could post a YouTube video and suddenly you're an independent journalist. Well, you're not doing journalism. You're doing street theater or something. <laughs> you're not following any principles of actually trying to find the truth whether or not, and you can certainly present the, the facts and say, okay, these are the facts and this is the conclusion I have drawn from them. I mean, I used to be an opinion writer, so that can be done. You can you can still be transparent and and try to lead your, your reader or your audience to a conclusion, but um, that's not necessarily being a journalist, especially if you do not have any facts to back up where you're going. Um, I guess essentially I, I hope that, you know, 20 years from now, the definition of journalist is the same, even if, again, the tools have, have radically changed, that those principles are still in place. Yeah, I would agree. I, I would agree with both of you. I, I, I hope the definition of journalist doesn't change, but the duties certainly have. And what Liz said about <coughs> deadlines is so true. Um, in our business, our deadline used to be uh, 5, 6, 10 p.m. If we went to a city council meeting, you scrambled to get back to the station and edit the video and get it on the air by 5 or 6. Now, uh, the struggle is we try to get it on as, quick, as quickly as we can, uh, independent of when it's actually on TV. So... Uh, and, and I think that puts a lot of stress on journalists, and I think especially in a market like Eau Claire, where a lot of our journalists are entry-level people, they've come to us straight out of college, they don't have a lot of experience, and I think when you send them out to cover uh, a complicated political issue or something like that, and then you expect them to uh, uh, get this thing on Facebook and Twitter immediately and then come back to the station and put it together for the evening news, you're asking a lot. You know, that's a, that's a tall order. I've been in this business for 46 years, and I would have trouble doing that, let alone somebody who's entry level. So, um, and I, again, as Jan and I have discussed, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. This is the this is the situation we're in now, and uh, hopefully, you know, the, the media companies will um, recognize that that's the situation we're in, and and change the way we're staffed. I think that's the thing that has to change. <coughs> Two things that come out of listening to this, you know, Liz talked about the speed. Um, social media has sped up um, the news cycle. Um, it's also, I think, made things uh, more personal when people are Twitter followers and when they like your Facebook page or your articles, they get to know the journalists better. I want to come. I want to come back. Um, to this idea of staffing in a minute, but could we talk a little bit first about how it's changed the relationship between individual journalists and news organizations and the audience they serve? How do you see social media affecting that relationship? Telegram has a Twitter feed, but the sports department has their separate one. Because that's, that's a different, you know, do I agree with that? Yes and no. I mean, we have an aggressive young sports department who has a lot of followers, you know, uh, high school athletes, college athletes. You know, they, they, they do different things that we would probably do uh, in the news department. 
you know, it's, it's just, I think it is a much closer relationship with some people. I mean, some people really want to, want to follow. This is the, the news they want. And maybe there is a specific reporter that they follow. You know, it's somebody who does enterprise pieces or investigative pieces or things like that. I think it is closer, but, but there obviously needs to be that complete separation. You know, you can't be, you, you're writing for an audience, but you can't be close to, the, to that audience. You don't want to be influenced by that audience. They'll certainly take their, their news tips and things like that. But you can't get too close to say, you know, I mean, I really think you, know, you should really be doing this story. Or, you, know, I, you know, I think you always have to be cautious. You have to be skeptical uh, if people are trying to get too close. I think that it's so easy on social media um, for journalists specifically to share their opinions on topics and we have to be so careful that we don't cross that line um, you know some of the journalists that i follow um, on twitter sometimes i i read their posts and i'm like oh i don't know if I, I don't know if i would have said that because it, it feels a little bit biased in some regards so like i'm terrified that I'm going to post something that is going to be biased or perceived that way. So I'm really, really careful about what I put on there. Generally, a lot of times what I'll do is I will take a quote from an article that I'm sharing, post that as like kind of an introduction or preface to the article um, and share it that way so that I'm not imposing my own beliefs or, or my opinion into that post. Um, on the other hand, Social media has been fantastic for getting a hold of sources. So there, ha there have been numerous times where I've found people or organizations on Facebook and I send them a message and I just say, hey, I'm, I'm Liz, a reporter for Wisconsin Public Radio or Leader Telegram. I'm looking you know, to talk to you about this particular thing. Here's my number, please call me. And like the number of times that that's been successful I, I can't even count. It's been really, really helpful in that regard. Another great um, uh, platform that I've used is Reddit. So I can follow like a specific channel, like you know Wisconsin, and I can post in there. One example was um, I was looking for people to talk about um, underage drinking, which is a real challenge to get young kids to talk about, <laughs> if you can guess. But um, but some of like the comments I got on there were really helpful and insightful, and it just. It helps to bring you closer, I think, to the community that you're trying to connect with. Um, but as Gary mentioned, you do have to be careful that that, that balance, um, that, that there's kind of a barrier that still exists, so you're not crossing any lines. Um, it's, it's, it's a really fragile environment that we have to be aware of. What, what was, could you restate your original question? <laughs> How has social media changed the relationships between the journalists and the public they serve? That's a good question. I mean, from the start of my career in journalism, we always had the, um, e this was obviously before social media had really blossomed, but we always had the email address at the bottom of the story and the phone number. So there was always a mechanism for people to reach out to you. I think having a social media presence personalizes it more. Um, for good and for ill, I think there are certain journalists that can really use that to an advantage because they can create that, you know, if you're a young journalist, you're creating your portfolio, you're creating your personal brand that you might take to another news organization and to another news organization. I mean, there are people I follow on Twitter who have worked for multiple, you know, news outlets and moving up the national level and it's like, oh, I know this person is a funny person or they're a good writer or they're going to get the scoop, so that's why I follow them. So there's certainly advantages there. I think, um, as, as, as maybe Liz alluded, there is the danger, though, of getting too chummy or the fact that the, the audience may feel like they, they own a piece of you or that they can control you in some way. Um, I think that maybe um, issue of boundaries was maybe it used to be a lot more of an issue and probably still is among broadcast journalists, you know, because you know the, the news anchor is coming into your home every night. So obviously, I know him or her. They're my friend, and so when I tell them something, they're going to have to listen to me, you know, or if I leave a note under their you know car windshield wiper or something like that. 
Um, they're going to listen to me. I, yeah, I'm certain. I'm certain it has. Um, and I think there, we face a lot of issues of boundaries in the society, and um, social media is not really helping that because they don't know you from you know as a journalist you don't know these people they're just on the other end but they feel like they know you and that you need to listen to them. Yeah, I think uh, social media has certainly made it more convenient. I don't know if it's easier, but more convenient for people to um, reach back to the journalist or uh, attack the journalist if that's what they want to do. Uh, it's very easy to do on to do on Twitter, especially with direct messaging. And I, we've certainly seen an uptick in that. And I th I worry sometimes about the influence that that has on young journalists. When it all came by email and it came to me because I was the manager, I could decide, well, I'm not letting, them, I'm not letting that reporter see that. Right now, now they, they, tweet, they tweet directly back to uh, the anchors and reporters and tell them, you know, awful things. You know, your hair is terrible, I hate you. I mean, just awful, awful stuff. And I can't shield them anymore. So, uh, and I worry sometimes if that isn't part of the problem we have in recruiting now. It's getting harder and harder. As I said on the radio last week, it's getting harder and harder to recruit people. I sometimes wonder if that isn't part of it. Actually, I thought Liz had a really good statement when she talked about she reads tweets sometimes from people and she kind of cringes from other journalists. I think journalists have to be really careful, you know, on Facebook, even just liking things. You know, if there's a if somebody makes a political post or something like that, I mean, you like it, your name's attached to that, and it's like. You need to be objective at all times. We've been talking about that um, in my beginning classes this week. This whole idea of journalists uh, being, well, they get in trouble for what they, what they put on social media. And so I was doing some reading and some background checking. And for example, in January of this year, the, at the Burlington Free Press, which is a digital and print community news organization in Vermont, they fired their executive director after a series of Twitter comments. Um, he had tweeted about Vermont's proposal to add a third gender opinion option, excuse me, to driver's license, and he and he wrote, and he tweeted about that in a negative way, and he lost his job. In April, the Atlantic fired columnist Kevin Williamson for past tweets he made on the issue of abortion. Recently, the Des Moines Register fired a young reporter who had been covering um, a viral phenomenon, a young man who had said, send me beer money. Did any of you see that? He said, send me beer money, young man. Um, <laughs> he, he had held up a sign at a, at a sporting event, send me beer money. He got so much beer money that he decided to donate it to a children's charity. Um, Anheuser Busch was the beer that he was buying. They decided they were going to put his face on, on a can. And the young reporter went to write this story and in digging found out that in this person's past there had been some racist social media comments. So that person lost that, that um, endorsement and Anheuser, I think, was still going to give the money. But people struck back and they started investigating this young reporter found out in his teens he had said and done some things that were questionable from that same perspective. He's no longer working at the paper. And so I use that as a cautionary tale to my students that your past will follow you. Your present stays with you online. It's, it's really hard to expunge that. You have to spend a lot of money and effort to get rid of that. So that this phenomenon leads me to my next question. The Society of Professional Journalists has come up with guidelines. I got a bunch of them listed here. But I want to know what you folks have in place at your organizations. Do you have any rules in place, any best practices that you tell your staff? Don't do this, do this, don't do that. What 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 are your guidelines? I don't think we have any formal things in place, but basically Anything we've always said, you know, even when before the internet was around, <clears throat> never write anything that you wouldn't want to see in print. That's you know, a copy editor. Don't write a headline that you don't want to see at the top of the front page. I mean, don't joke around about it. You know, and the same thing with Facebook and Twitter and all social media. I mean, you wouldn't tweet something out that you wouldn't want to put in your story, or that you wouldn't run past your editor. Say, you think we should run this? I mean, the editor would say, for God's sakes, no. <laughs> no. So you, 
I, I don't think it's any different. I mean, if you're really, if you put it down in writing or on broadcast uh, on YouTube or something, right? I mean, it's still your written product. This is it's coming from you personally as a journalist, and it's going to be taken as such. Yeah, I mean, WPR does have specific guidelines about how we approach social media. Um, and I think, you know, one of the most important ones um, that might seem obvious, but we still need to be reminded of because we're humans too, um, is, you know, stay away from, from uh, politi you know, political comments because um, it's so important that the public perceives us as unbiased. It's important that we maintain um, that relationship from, you know, between us and our, um, you know, the community we serve. So, um, yeah, I think that's why when, I mean, yeah, we're given the freedom to be on social media, of course, like it's a wonderful tool for us, but um, it, it really is important that we are thinking um, analytically about how our posts can be construed um, and you know whether there's bias in that and just to be very careful about what we put out there. I think if there's a best practice I've always tried to um, only post things on social media that I would want my mother to read <laughs> and I think if most people went by that standard um, <laughs> the world would be a better place but uh, we, we are I think somewhat unique in that um, a, we don't cover a lot of directly political issues. So the issue of political engagement or commentary by staff members, um, if it were to happen, which it probably doesn't very much, um, is not, would not raise the red flags as it would in um, a lot of other media organizations. So, and secondly, we, our, our publication relies a lot on freelancers and on um, contributors and so forth and, you know, we would have no control over what any of them would do um, in their social media lives. And we don't, I believe, have much of a set policy other than, you know, you shouldn't be engaging in, in political things on, on company time and so forth. But I think mostly it's the, the, the people that work at Volume 1 know that, hey, you know, you're in a public position, so comport yourselves appropriately. The you know, art company, uh, and just for background, our station is owned by Quincy Media. They own a bunch of TV stations in Wisconsin and Illinois, mostly in the upper Midwest. So the employee handbook has, uh, I believe, five pages devoted to rules for social media for employees. Yeah, it's pretty extensive. Unfortunately, most of it's out of date now. It was <laughs> five years ago. But, um, uh, one of the things I, I've had to caution my employees on, because a lot of the TV people have their personal Facebook page that they've had since they were in high school or whatever, and then they'll create a, a page specifically for uh, their role at the station. And I had an employee one time who posted a picture that she had taken at, a, at an event that she was covering. I'd sent her there as a reporter, but she posed for a picture with a candidate and put it on her personal page. And I called her <laughs> at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, and I said, you have to take that down now. You cannot. And she said, that's my personal page. Nobody sees that. I said, no. Everybody sees that, and, and everybody has the ability to screen grab it and send it around the world and show, say, see, here's my proof of my claim that you're biased. You know. So, and, and again, a lot of this has to do with uh, young people who are on their first or second job in, in the business, and they, and they don't know. So. Yeah, we have five pages of policies to tell them, here's what you can do and what you can't do. They have to sign a form saying, yes, I understand, and yes, I read all that. I don't know if they actually read it, but they signed the form saying <laughs> Let's talk about a little bit more about these young people and the jobs that they're going to be pursuing in the next few years. We know that the numbers of uh, Daily journalists has, have been on the decline for the last decade. I, I was doing some reading and saw that um, da some data suggests that many journalism and PR jobs haven't gone away so much as that they've changed their names. Digital content producer may be one example. <laughs> because that did not used to exist. Mm -hmm. That did not used to no, exist. No, in my position, when I, um, when I took it, it was brand new. 
I mean, that was those those two new positions were were made specifically for us to um, focus on digital content. So yeah. So so if I could ask each of you to be a little bit of a of a of a future predictor, you know, gaze into your crystal balls and think about where do you see the jobs developing and what what are students, future future journalists going to need to be able to do that they don't have to yet do or or that they're going to be doing more of from your perspective. And and maybe they won't even be at, at news organizations that look like what you folks now do. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? I think you'll see a lot more positions like Liz's. I mean everybody's gonna have to do that. I mean the newspaper, will it be just a digital newspaper one day? Possibly. So everybody is going to have to be able to shoot video and take photos and do all, all the photo work as, in addition to writing the stories. You know, back in the old days, I mean, I'm a writer, I'm not a photographer. You know, I'm not a videographer. Well, yes you are now. You know, and you have, to have, you have to have a better skill set. You have to have more skills. Uh, the good people will always have jobs. I mean, the good. I agree with Tom that journalists are still going to be journalists. They're going to be out, you know, gathering news, gathering information, going through it, telling people what they need to know to, you know, educate them, to entertain them. Uh, the good people will always be able to do it. But that's as Jen, as you know, the good people, the best people that you have can do it all. Just like it's the same with reporters now for all these staffs. You know, the best people can do it all. I mean, the, the more valuable you make yourself, you have to have diverse skills. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, and you, you stole all my ideas here. <laughs> um, I disagree. <laughs> no, I think, um, you know, when I first started out as a reporter for the Chippewa Herald, I was um, editor of our community page. I was covering education. I was taking photos, you know, for general assignments. I um, I was on our social media pages. I mean, you, um, at that time, we weren't so invested in video, but that was still, that was still something that you could use to market yourself if you're looking for a job. I think that I also agree with Gary in the sense that I hope I hope that the the role of what a journalist is doesn't change because in a time of of um, fake news it's it's so important that we stick by those standards um, that that define us and separate us from the rest of the pack. So um, I'm I'm hopeful that that doesn't change. But certainly we need to be well rounded. We need to be um, on top of the technology that's coming up. Um, we need to constantly stay educated, um, you know, about where people are consuming their news. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that those those elements, um, that baseline of what makes us who we are, doesn't change. And you stole what I was going to say. <laughs> um, there's an interesting split here, and in that I think. As, as both of these people have said, that th there's more generalization of skills. Um, I've certainly done a lot more in my career in terms of skills I've had to develop um, th than I was trained for, certainly. Um, and I haven't even done a lot of the same things that, that many other people that still work in print um, have done. I haven't done a lot of video, for example. Um, that being said, I think for media to survive, there's actually going to be more specialization of the outlets themselves. Um, there's not going to be as many um, outlets that are generalist, like we're going to cover, cover everything from soup to nuts um, in, in, in one community or nationwide. Um, you know, the, the publications nationwide, with some exceptions like, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post, which have done very well. Um, over the years, or over the very recent past, um, you know, big outlets like Newsweek or Time or Life that decades ago were dominant have waned and very specialized kinds of publications and outlets have um, grown more prominent or at least become profitable within their niches. So I think a, you'll see more um, specialized 
outlets even on a, on a local level. I don't know what that looks like and how those models are um, you know, sustainable financially, but I think that's more of the jobs that will be available to those um, content producers or whatever they're called in five years. <laughs> My uh, crystal ball doesn't work very well because <clears throat> I'm the guy that thought the Vikings were going to beat the Bears last Sunday, which <laughs> didn't work out so well. Uh, I think uh, the basic skills that journalists have always had are still the skills they will need. The other skills that we're talking about are technical things. And uh, I don't mean to dismiss them, but what I've been finding as uh, the young people coming into my newsrooms, my former newsroom, um, got younger and younger, uh, those technical skills, they, they, it was almost innate with them. They, they immediately gravitated toward, they know how to post up stuff on Facebook and Twitter, they know how to clip video from their phone and send it out as a tweet, they, they get all that stuff. The only people I had trouble with were people like Keith Edwards, who hadn't opened up his Facebook page in five years. Um, I, I love him, don't get me wrong. Uh, but uh, I think the skills that they need coming in are the same skills that uh, they've always needed, and it's just these technical things which I think most young people can master pretty quickly. Yeah, I think, I think what we talk to them about in our program is that there's always going to be buttons to push, but it's understanding what's news and how to synthesize and explain it to people that that's going to be the remaining thing. What we've heard a lot of here tonight is, is some of um, both the positives and the negatives of social media, the idea that um, it's fast, it can be personal, um, it can expand your reach and allow you to build a brand and, and a relationship with people but that it has challenges in terms of making sure that it's used responsibly, um, making sure that it has the same standards that uh, the other traditional delivery platforms have provided. Um, and I think that what we need to do now is let some of the other people in the room ask their questions. So what I'm gonna do is get up I will bring the mic to you so that everybody can hear you. And if someone has a question, why don't you go ahead and let me know that you have a question. I'll bring the mic over to you and you can ask the panel. Doug. I'm interested in uh, the definition of social media. You've talked about a few platforms as if we all know them. Uh, <laughs> and also uh, as if there weren't a whole lot more and yet Social media seems to be a huge complex of communication uh, opportunities. Um, and the first word in the phrase social uh, <coughs> suggests a very different thing from what we've been talking about. So could you address the term social media and what you take it to mean and why you think it's so important in the news business? I guess it's just people connecting with each other, you know, and that's what we try to do with the news organization is get get people to we try to connect with them through social media. And it's another another avenue for us to get news across to people, you know, through Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat. Uh, it's just people connecting with people. That's why Facebook started. You also know, you keep up with your high school classmates, that kind of thing. And, and then, it, then it just got kind of crazy and spun out of control. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want us all to answer, but I... You um, don't all have to answer, but if you have something you want to add? <laughs> no. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> no, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely a tool for connection. I mean, I think, um, like Gary had said, it started out, I mean, I think I, I got my first Facebook page in 2006. So uh, it's, yeah, a way for people to connect, whether it's with family and friends, like Facebook is, whether it's to connect with certain, you know, like communities of people, like Reddit is. Um, I mean, you can kind of, you can find a platform for pretty much anything. So I think just keeping it really general as just a, a connection and communication tool I, I don't know if that's very helpful, but that's just kind of how I perceive it. That can be riddled with um, 
uh, fact and opinion. It's a scary place to navigate, that's for sure. Yeah, Facebook is the one where you connect with your high school classmates <laughs> and see that they're doing better than you are. Twitter is the one where, where Trump rants. Um, you know, Instagram, I'm not sure. The, the trouble is, um, for those of us of a certain age, um, there is always something new coming along in terms of social media. And you hear, I don't know if there are stats to back this up, there probably are, but that people under a certain age are not on Facebook, or at least they're not very engaged with Facebook. They might have an account, and they put a few pictures on there um, so their parents and grandparents can share them, but the real action is happening on Snapchat or on Instagram or something that I have not even heard of because I'm in my 40s. Um, but it, yeah, the, the social element is supposed to be key. It is supposed to be that two-way street. And ideally, it can be a beneficial relationship where, you know, traditionally media was all about like, here's our newspaper, here's our broadcast, you know, you eat it, <laughs> you consume it, and then the next day we give you another one. And um, obviously there's always been mechanisms for feedback, but social media, when it's done well, actually allows a conversation, actually allows people to ask the reporter questions, or the opinion maker questions, or the politician questions, and you might actually get feedback. It allows um, for good and ill organizations or um, elected officials um, to circumvent traditional routes and go directly to um, the audience without some intermediary, which um, you know obviously has drawbacks. But um, hopefully that social element is not completely lost and, and, and Facebook and Twitter don't completely devolve into we're pushing out and you're consuming. I don't have a lot more to say other than you, you said there are a lot more than just the ones we've talked about, and you're right. But the fact of the matter is, for local media especially, I think we tend to focus on, on Facebook and Twitter because they have, by mountains, more uh, people on them than any other page, especially Facebook. Uh, Facebook has um, 70, 60, 70 percent of the country is on Facebook in one form or another is the last I saw. And the next thing is Twitter, that's like a 20 and it goes down after that. Although those are always changing. But uh, yeah. so that's that's why I think I think all of us focus on those two and and more uh, Instagram lately. Yeah, I think I think the thing about Facebook is that people have the accounts but we aren't using them the same way that we have. Gunga, you're gonna have to jump in here. My colleague is here. She teaches our social media class, so Gunga should be sharing her thoughts here. Um, and I think Insta Instagram is is becoming a really interesting reporting tool. I, I've seen a lot of news organizations starting to use it to tell short stories because, and and it's helping young people think like storytellers because they have their Instagram accounts and they are using them to kind of build a timeline of stories. It's it's very interesting to watch. Another question here. And then we'll come to you. It seems to me that the modern journalism is, is a battle between opinion and news. Um, what ways do you um, try to educate people uh, on what the truth is? Because it feels like um, a reporter at the White House will say, well, that's not really true. One or, one or two reporters may say that, but the rest of them won't say anything. So what ways do, either on a local level or like for the state of Wisconsin, you know, how do you um, make sure that people are educated? How do you reach out to them and say, hey, this, this is not true and this is the truth? I think it's a phenomenon called um, false equity, um, but it's the idea that um, in the past, journalism was essentially 
this is one side, this is a perspective from one side, this is a perspective from the other side. You, the public, can figure out the truth based on that information that I'm giving you. Now, um, because there's so much uh, noise around you know, fake news and what is actually truth um, and what isn't, um, a lot of journalists have taken it upon themselves to identify those falsehoods in the story um, and, and you know, they'll, they'll give a quote or uh, mention something that somebody says and then say, um, you know, the actual truth, like this isn't actually correct and then um, sort of like try to correct it in the story so that that truth is getting to the public. So I think that's one way that the conversation is sort of changing um, from that, that simple like dual dynamic to more of a, um, us taking on the responsibility of saying, okay, like this is one person's point of view, this is the other, but this is this is the truth, and this is what you need to know to make an informed decision. Um, so. Nicely done. Thanks. <laughs> Anybody else want to take a step? <laughs> okay. um, I think I promised you next. <coughs> How does social media play a role in elections? I gotta give you know my my fellow journalists some uh, <laughs> time to answer. It plays a role. It plays a role. And I think you were talking about it earlier. I mean, the idea that uh, that politicians can eliminate the middle person, they can eliminate the media by going straight to the public, they can talk over the media. That's that's one way that social media works. Yeah. Um, they can do a lot of grassroots campaigning. Want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, and this goes beyond you know the kind of news my organization covers, but. I mean, there's obviously a, a lot, a, a great role that social media can play in targeting people. You know, you can find, if I want to reach, you know, women 30 to 35 with two children in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, or in this part of this zip code of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, I can do that, and I can, I can sell them, you know, life insurance or diapers or a candidate. And so it certainly allows much more targeting than ever before, um, which is why there's been a lot of, I mean, there's certainly been controversy over that. There has been meddling um, or attempts at meddling with that. And there is a lot of money to be made by Facebook and the like. It used to be that, um, you know, decades ago or even in the recent past, candidates and campaigns would be spending a lot of money on um, maybe print advertising, maybe get out the vote, um, you know, with with door-to-door -door stuff, and that certainly still happens, or they'd be buying a heck of a lot of TV ads. But I imagine, um, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this, how much of that advertising money has shifted away from television and toward online advertising, because it's probably a lot more cost-effective if I'm a candidate to target people that are my voters or my potential voters um, you know, those 30 to 35 year old women than to buy an ad in a newspaper or on a radio or television to try to reach that same group of people because you're obviously reaching a much wider swath. I, I don't know the numbers. I, I, you know, didn't have a lot of contact with our sales department. Um, but I do know, I, I heard a piece on NPR four years ago where uh, they interviewed one of uh, Trump's uh, campaign people. And he was laughing at the fact that the Democrats were spending all of this money on traditional media. And he said, we're not wasting our time on that. We know where our voters are, and we're putting all of our money in social media, mostly Facebook, in those states. And he, he identified five states. And he was laughing at the Democrats because they were so foolish that they were still spending their money this old-fashioned way. So again, that doesn't really have anything to do with local news coverage. But uh, in terms of the ad, ad dollars, I think you're going to see next year um, a significant amount. You you won't be able to click on anything online without seeing somebody's political ad, mm -hmm. um, because I think they've all got that. No, that's how you win the race. I think too that um, something that you mentioned in terms of talking about how it affects the election, we've all probably heard in the news about Facebook and the 2016 election and the Russian troll farms planting ads 
on Facebook, and we all saw them. And we had no idea necessarily that they were not from real U.S. groups. And so that's another thing that we can think about happening in this upcoming election cycle. It may not just be Russians, there could be Chinese, there could be other entities that use our social media platforms to put out messages that may or may not be accurate, but will certainly push our buttons. And that's a way that social media can really confuse our political um, interactions because it could just foment a lot of anger, um, I think, at each other. And that's going to be something that I think the journalists who we trust or we rely on to let us know what's really going on is to try to try to report on those things and, and debunk them. But I think people are going to have to be very good critical thinkers as well. Gunda wants to say something. We're going to listen. Uh, speaking of elections, uh, are my students in my social media class in 2016, I've, uh, excuse my voice, I have a raspy throat. Uh, they compared uh, DNC website, uh, social media sites to RNC, Republican Party, and we found out, we, we uh, split the class in different groups to see if they would come up with the same uh, for, you know, results, and overwhelmingly, RNC uh, social media platforms like Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, blogging too, uh, you know, RNC did much better. And one of the things that they, uh, they did it very smartly was engaging, uh, you know, uh, their voters, their members who were brand ambassadors. So one of the key things about social media is not just being a content creator, whether you're a journalist or any other organization, but making sure that there is ripple effect, that somebody else is now spreading the message for you. So these are the brand ambassadors that the RNC was very effective in marketing. Whereas I, you know, I think with this uh, feeling that uh, Democrats are mostly educated people and RNC you know, we've, it's, it's a different uh, expectation, but what happened is, here we found out that whether it was uh, one platform or the other, consistently, whether it was selling products, uh, selling personal stories, like Jan was talking about, how, about how uh, this candidate is good for us, and uh, for, you know, having farmers speak, we don't even know if these were bots, some of them, or, you know, uh, but nowadays, when you're thinking of journal, and I was reading up about journalism, we don't think about LinkedIn and Instagram as two social media platforms. But I was reading that in LinkedIn, more and more journalists, especially when it comes to economics and other areas, are getting the, the, LinkedIn has dedicated journalism staff who curate the content so that they know it's not just taking, you know, information from elsewhere, but they curate the content, they accept stories, but they make sure that it's, you know, it's like Jan says repeatedly in class, triangulated, which is very important, checking out your sources. So irrespective of which platform you use, social media or not, bottom line is, as one of the panelists said, is basic journalism values, which is be uh, unbiased, be truthful, and it doesn't matter which platform you use. Did someone else have a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. I get very disgusted with myself <laughs> at times because I waste too much time fiddling around with Facebook and some of these other things. I'm trying to discipline myself to avoid doing that. But apparently you have to do that if you're trying to stay on top of things. This is a man who subscribes to five newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, you can't do it all. That's well, the problem. But I wondered if you had any comments on that. And secondly, over the years, I have been astonished at people who are in positions of decision making not following the news. For example, um, the, uh, uh, there are some stories in the uh, leader telegram about uh, charges uh, against the per diem charges against uh, people jailed in other counties. 
And the concern is whether Eau Claire is going to do that or thinking about doing that. And so I've spoken to several uh, county board members and they weren't even aware of the issue. And it's been in the newspaper. And I've had my judicial colleagues, um, I've uh, seen stories involving the courts and I talked to them the next day uh, uh, about it and they haven't, weren't aware of it. And I've always been uh, concerned about that and I wondered if you had any comments. You could spend a whole semester talking about the need to be a good citizen and pay attention to what's going on around you. But I'll let these folks handle the question. I think it's a very sad topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we find that a lot too uh, when we're interviewing people. You know, we, we've written previous stories about a topic and we go to <coughs> sources who are at least casually involved in this in this issue and they have no clue about it. They haven't heard about it. I agree. There's county board members sometimes, uh, other organizations. Uh, they're like, well, gee, I guess I haven't heard that. Said, well, we've, we had stories the last two days about it. You know, you need, you know, you have to take some responsibility yourself. It's just like when we talked about when you use social media, you don't just go look at Facebook, oh, gee, I believe that and that and that and that. I mean, you have to educate yourself and be a critical thinker. You know. And you do that by reading, you know, credible sources. You know, I mean, I, I wish I had a magic answer to that too. How do you educate people better uh, to prepare yourself for life? You know, to be an informed citizen so you can vote next year. I think we all should be concerned that um, we're not reading the news. We're not paying attention to what's happening. It's terrifying. Um, I, I understand that it's a bit overwhelming. You can subscribe to five newspapers, you can follow all the organizations you can on Twitter and Facebook and all the other media platforms, and you can get lost in all of that, all of that information. Um, but I don't think that the fact that all this information exists and it's overwhelming is an excuse to not be informed at all. We have to recognize that, um, we have to identify what's important to us. Local news is important to us. We have to pay attention to what's happening because our voices matter. All of us, all of us have a say in what goes on in our community. And if we don't know what the issues are, then how can we have an opinion about what should be done about it? Like, it's, it is terrifying. And I wish I knew the answer, too, to get more people involved. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but, but yeah, I'm worried. I'm worried as you are. <laughs> um, but I also think the fact that you said, you know, you can get lost in Facebook and, you know, subscribe to all these newspapers, I think that's great that you're diversifying um, your sources, you know, where you're getting all this information. I, I commend you for that. I think that's wonderful. Um, if the Honorable Tom Bartland cannot survive on Facebook, <laughs> there is no hope for the rest of us. Um, it is over, social media can be overwhelming, and I, I think we have to sometimes remind ourselves that these tools were not developed necessarily to inform us. They do serve that function, and sometimes they serve it well. Um, they were meant to connect us with each other, and they were meant to, frankly, get us addicted to the, the, the rush of the getting the like and the share and seeing an opinion that is like ours or maybe an opinion that is diametrically opposed to ours that will make us angry and make us want to spend more time on them and comment. Today in my own job, I went to Facebook to do something, um, to, to do with something I was working on and 10 minutes later, I said, oh, why am I here? I literally had to close Facebook, turn away from the computer, and see the piece of paper that was sitting on my desk. Oh yeah, that's why I went there. I mean, it is not designed to be, oh, I'm just going to go there, I'm going to, you know, it's like picking up my morning newspaper and reading a few headlines and now I'll be informed. It is meant to suck you in and to spend as much time in that environment as possible, no matter, um, you know, what emotional buttons they have to, to push. So, I guess... 
That's kind of a dystopic vision. Of it. Yeah, I, I worry that uh, people have been seduced into thinking that social media has taken the place of all the other media, when in fact, all, all it really is for is to uh, drive you someplace else. That, that's, that's what we intended to be. We don't intend it to be a, a, a be all end all. We intended to get you to read the headline and say, I want to read that article and click and go to our website or watch our TV station. But I do know that, uh, you know, my wife is 66 years old and the first thing she does when her feet hit the floor in the morning is she picks up her phone and starts scrolling through her Facebook feed to see, you know, who died overnight in some town we lived in 20 years ago or whatever. But I mean, that's, that's what she does. Um, and we used to get a daily newspaper and read the daily newspaper every day. I read yours online every day, here, just so you know. Um, and, and, I, and we are paid subscribers. But, but you know, that, I think that, that habit of getting up in the morning and reading the morning paper has been supplanted for some people into getting up and scrolling through the feed on my phone. And I, I think it's very troubling. I, I don't know what to do about it. I'm a single mom, no, I'm just, this is a hypothetical. You know, I'm a single mom, I've got three kids, I'm gonna have to work the night shift after I get them back from school and set up the sitter. I don't have time to pay attention to all of this stuff. And I'm just hoping that it's all gonna be okay. I mean, these are the kinds of things that you hear out and about in the community. I was in a bank talking to a member officer and something came up on my news feed and I said, oh, and I mentioned what it was and she said, really, that's real? I was hoping it was a joke. These things have to, they're pervasive, but it takes time for them to sink into people's psyches because they do not have time to worry about this. You folks are influencers. You're paying attention and you're reading and because you read five newspapers and have conversations with your friends, they probably look to you as, 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 a, as an influencer, somebody who's going to tell them what's going on and help them think about it. But most people, I think, don't have that kind of time. And that's why, if they are at all looking at social media, they're getting most of their news from social media, and the things that rise to the top are the most outrageous. And they don't always take the time to delineate between what's real and what's not. And I think that's, that's going to be a real challenge, as this young woman was talking to us about how is it going to affect the, affect the next election. That, that's going to be a real issue for us. I have time for another question or so. Is there somebody else who hasn't had a chance yet who would really like to get their question addressed? Yes, you can. Uh, what is the question of citizen journalism? Well, and we are talking about credibility and social media. If what, what do you think about citizen journalism and the risks involved in soliciting stories from the public? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you very well. She, she talked about what are the risks involved in soliciting stories from the public. Oh. Maybe maybe they they captured some audio, they captured some video, and now they're turning it over to the newspaper or the TV station, the radio station. What do you do with it? How do you handle it? Well, you have to be careful with it. First of all, there's been citizen, you know, participation in newspapers forever. I, my first, I started my career in Arcadia, the weekly newspaper, and probably the most popular thing was the elderly lady who wrote about who was coming to town and visited so and so for the potluck. You know, my grandkids were in town. We would be half a page of that every weekend. People, if she went on vacation, people would call and say, "What happened to Agnes's cow?" You know, that being said, uh, you have to always be careful. Like we discussed it earlier, that about people having agendas. I mean, if you're going to go to a meeting or you see something, you know, I know if uh, I'm sending Andrew Dowd out to a to a meeting and he takes a video of something, I know where it came from. I know what he was doing. Somebody else sends this in and says, well, here's what this is. How do I know that for sure? Or the meeting they went to, you know, they quoted somebody, a supervisor or so-and-so in the town of Brunswick. Uh, how do I know that? I don't, I don't know this person. Uh, you have to build that trust. I mean, we have correspondents, we have freelance people who we trust, but that trust is gained over a period of time. I mean, just somebody suddenly shooting me an email with a photo and say, hey, what do you think about this? I don't think that much about it until I find out more about it. 
Yeah, I think like we have to vet that information, definitely. I mean, um, people have tons of great ideas. Yeah, some people have um, um, agendas that you know they want us to pursue, and 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 that's that's fine. That's their prerogative. They can reach out to us, but it's our job to take on that responsibility and figure out um, how to balance the story, how to get the truth out there. Um, yeah, that that is an obligation that falls to us. <laughs> I agree with what they yeah. said. Uh, yeah, it, it, the the vast majority of the citizen journalist stuff we get is weather pictures. You know, every time there's a storm, <laughs> hail storm, look at the look at the snow. It'll be snow soon. Um, so, you know, I, I I keep saying like I'm still there. I task I tasked past tense my uh, meteorologist or my whoever the editor on duty is to vet that stuff and make sure it's correct. Make sure it hasn't been photoshopped and it wasn't a picture stolen from some storm 20 years ago, which has happened, by the way. Um, yeah. But by and large, you know, and, and I think it's probably like the people who write letters to the editor in the paper. The pictures that you get are from pretty much the same people all the time. You get, you get a lot of repeat yeah. customers and you come to trust them after a while. We've covered a lot of territory here. We've talked about some of the, how people view social media, how they use it in their newsrooms, how they try to police it. We've talked about its effect on our communities. We haven't hit everything. There's room for more conversations. But we do appreciate you coming tonight and taking an interest in the future of journalism, whether it involves social media or some other new thing that we haven't even thought of yet. We hope that you'll support good journalism, and by good journalism I mean journalism that follows the principles of accuracy, uh, verification, independence of faction. These are the hallmarks of good journalism and it's what you should expect from us. But thank you for being here tonight and I hope you'll visit a little bit with our guests before you leave. <laughs>